Describe yourself that would have equipped us to be able to face the onslaughts of the devil. But you have been go so good, you have been able to sustain us. You are the one that kept. You are the one that is keeping. And you are the one that will yet keep us. We are praying therefore that no matter what may be happening, the winds of backsliding that may be blowing and the cunning craftiness of the devil, the slight of Satan and of men, we pray dear Lord that you will keep our two feet planted on the solid rock in Jesus name we are asking dear Lord that in these last days when there is serious erosion of convictions you will help us to remain rooted and grounded in Christ and abandoned therein with thanksgiving and increasing in the knowledge of God and also in our relationship with God. Help us that no matter what the devil may succeed with other people, he will not succeed with us. And wherever we may be under the sun, grace can keep us. Even in the worst of circumstances, so we pray, may your grace be sufficient for us in Jesus' name. Today, we ask that you will speak in serious, strong terms, and as well as simple ways, that we will never forget what you are saying in Jesus' name. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We started last Monday in our studies in Second Peter. And I told you that this is not an expository study per se, because if we are going to do that, we will not cover all the grounds that ought to be covered, and the goal is to finish a chapter within the little time we have. And already time is flying away from us today. So, we go to Second Peter chapter 2. But before we do that, let's remind ourselves what we, we learned last Monday. We were taught about the fact that this epistle was written by Peter. And that Peter had a singular purpose. And that purpose was manifested in the repetition of that word, remember or remembrance second peter chapter 1 verse 12 wherefore i will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things although you know them and you are established in the present truth and ye i think in verse 13 i think it means as long as i am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my disease, after my death, to have these things always in remembrance. You'll see that word is the key word in the study of Second Peter. Remember or remembrance or remembered. In Second Peter chapter 3 verse 1. This second epistle. Brethren, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. I told you that Peter was uh, wise. And those of us who are leaders, let's be wise. Let's draw from the wealth of our own experience to teach people that are under us. So they can learn from our own experience and our own life and we can deepen there. We may know scriptures, Genesis to Revelation. If we don't bring practicality into the things we'll give out, it will be so much knowledge, no experience. I told you that Peter was careful about reminding the believers over and over again because 
he knew the weakness in human nature that we often forget what we should remember and we remember the things we should forget. Himself, the Lord told him, Peter, uh, you will deny me. Ah, he said, never. Others may deny you. I will not deny you. And then Jesus said, you particularly, you are going to deny me. Not just that all of the others will abandon me. You will deny me. And he said, never. You, you have been giving prophecy, Lord, and they have been coming to pass. But this one, you missed it. Never. But eventually the thing came to pass. Unfortunately, he remembered too late when he had already denied Christ. So he knew then the importance of reminding the believers that there are some things we might have known, we might have been established in them, but we need to remind ourselves of them again. And we should not be intimidated as ministers if you have to preach a message that you have preached before. Even Jesus Christ, he preached some messages that he had preached before and he repeated them again. Sometimes he repeated even the same message two times, three times in the same the gospel to tell you that we shouldn't feel it's anything that if you have preached a message before you want to repeat it again. If the Lord told this, we do that because our people like to hear new, new things. But the problem is, what have they done with the old things they have had? If people have not done anything with the old things they have had, why give them new things? Lest they become like the Athenians, who are just interested in hearing some new uh, rumors, some new stories, some new uh, idea, but they don't do much of what they hear. And so, we then uh, saw that Pete from there, he needed to put them in remembrance of what he had been telling them before. And of course, we learned that he, he, he gave them special greeting. He said, the people he was writing to, they were people who had obtained like precious faith. And that by the grace of God, we are eating together from the same place, and we are people of like precious faith. We are of the same mind, we are of the same persuasion, we are of the same uh, love, and we are of the same vision. And I, I hope I can say we have the same conviction. And then we also know that Peter that wrote the epistle, he called himself the servant of Jesus. Humility. Even though after he had raised the dead, he had done great exploits, he had raised up Tabitha from the dead, he had preached, he had opened the door of the gospel to the Gentiles, he still called himself servant of the Lord. That's humility on his part. And that we should learn from that. And then we also learn that he gave them a, an important key. That the only antidote against backsliding is that you keep going forward. If you stand still, some evil may meet you there. That if you don't want to backslide, the best solution to backsliding is to forward slide. If you don't forward slide, you will backslide. And if you don't want to backslide, keep on forward sliding. Once you are forward sliding, you will not backslide. And Peter told them that there are steps that we should keep climbing. After the foundation of faith, we lay other foundations on there. And one after the other, and we don't throw away the other one we have had before. Uh, you know when you are climbing a high building, and you climb the first staircase, and uh, the first uh, staircase a bit, and then you go to the second, when you get to the second staircase, you don't throw up the one, the, the first one, because you will remember, I may need it later. And we who are believers, as we are climbing up, we don't throw away the things we had before. We keep them there, but we build on them, and we go on like that. And then we also learn that Peter eventually rounded off the first chapter, or this part, the part that has now been called chapter 1 of Second Peter. When he wrote the letter, there was no chapter, there was no verse. But this first chapter hangs on a note of conviction that the solid ground that I have for my abiding boldness, I need to remind you, brothers and sisters, that Peter was crucified for Christ according to the church history. The same way Jesus was killed, the same way Peter was killed. And no man will die for a fool. No man will die for something that he was not sure of. These people were so sure of what they believed. They were so sure of what Christ said. They were so sure of the thing they had obtained that they were ready to die for it. We're told that when they were about to kill him, 
when they were looking for him, he escaped and he was running out of the city. And as he was going out of the city, he got to the city gate and he saw a vision. He saw Christ. I said, my Lord, my master, where are you going? And the master said, I'm going to the city. Ah, why are you going to the city? He said, to go and die the second time. Because you don't want to die for me, therefore I want to go and die again. And Peter understood the message. So he went back to the city and said, I'm ready now. I will die. And when they were about to crucify him, he told those people, he said, please, it will be an insult to my master for me to die the way my master died. They crucified my master head up. Crucify me head down. Because I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy to die the same way my master died. And Peter allowed himself, you know, to be, they put his head down, put his feet up, and that was how he died. Now, people could die for something like that because they were sure, they were certain, they were convinced of what they were dying for. Is your faith worth dying for? Can you die for what you believe in Christ? Many times, we will not be called to die. Maybe we'll be called to suffer some little inconvenience. Maybe we'll be called to suffer some little persecution. Maybe we'll be called to suffer some hunger, suffer some deprivation, suffer some difficulties. Difficulty for children, difficulty for wives, difficulty for anything. Difficulty for our blood body. Maybe we'll be called to suffer some pain, not even to die now. Can you suffer that for Christ? And that's why, you know, Peter should know. When you are reading the letter of a person like this, you are talking about a man who had experience, a deep man. And although he doesn't have too much reasoning and logic like Pete, like Paul the Apostle, he was not that educated, he was not that learned, he was not that uh, exposed in uh, learning, but his letter was deep because he was writing out of the heart. He said, we have not followed cunningly devised videos. That the thing we are talking to you about, they are not things that we pick by the roadside. They are things that we have been assured of. They are things that we are ready to die for. And when they were called to lay down their life for it, they died for it. You have been on the Mount of Transfiguration at various times in your Christian life. Maybe not as mighty as the one Peter had, but you have also been on the Mount of Transfiguration. The things that God has told you, the things that God has built into your life, the things that God has given to you, are you ready? Do you hold them in such a high esteem? Are they so important to you that you are ready to die for them? Or, not to die, but to suffer for them. You are ready to abandon house? So send her you. To labor unrewarded. To forsake home and brethren, friends and dear ones. To labor without being rewarded. To toil without being praised. So send I you to die or to labor for me alone. We are told about the message the pastor preached many years ago. Come and die. That is, when you receive the call to serve the Lord, are you ready? Is your call up to a point that is in case I need to die for that thing, I'm, go- I'm ready to go that path. And yet soldiers who are fighting for government, fighting for the nation. They sign at the time they are coming in that I am ready to defend the country, the integrity of my country, at the risk of my life. And we were told of some of them, when they were going to fight a battle and uh, they wanted to uh, climb a particular difficulty to get to a mountain and the enemy was so they were on that mountain and these people they knew that the only way they could take that mountain, I'm talking about the uh, German army now, that the only way they could take that, sorry, the Israeli army, the only way they could take that mountain was to wear out the bullets and ammunition of their enemies. And so they said, we need number, many, many people, thousands, so that they will just go in, they will be killed. But eventually the bullet of the enemy will finish. 
because the enemy cannot come down to go and rearm themselves. So we will wear out their bullets. When their bullet finishes, then we can conquer them. And so they send them, and those people, they are gunning them down, gunning them down, gunning them down, gunning them down, gunning them down. And they say, advance. And they kept going. And the people who are, the, who are still going forward, they will climb over the dead body of the people that have been killed. They are gunned down until the enemy's bullet finished. Then the others who remain were able to take the battle. The people can do that for government and for nations. What price are we ready to pay to serve the Lord? If it demands little difficulty from something that will pay you a little, something that will give you inconvenience, something that will injure you a little, something that will demand something from you, something that will, you know, that is something that will take something from you more than normal. Are we ready to give that thing and say, if the Lord wants it, let him have it? It was that that made Peter to write with conviction. He said, we are not police, we are first-hand witnesses. He said, and apart from that, the word of God says so. And because the word of God says so, and we are tasted it, we are not following cunningly devised things. Thank God for people like Peter. I don't know how the Christian church would have cared if Peter had not written this epistle. But today, we're going to another part, another important thing in the epistle of Peter to the believers that time. We call this part warning against doctrinal and life contamination. Warning against doctrinal and life contamination. Doctrinal contamination, life contamination. In Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people. Stop there. But there were false prophets. There were false prophets also among the people. Here the apostle Peter, as I told you, there was no chapter and verse division. So that word God is looking back at chapter one, last verse. Verse twenty one says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke, as they were moved, by the Holy Ghost. But as those holy men of God were speaking, there were unholy men, false men, ungodly men also. And as those holy men were being moved by the Holy Ghost, there were these false men also in the church in the wilderness, in the Jewish church, there were also false prophets who were not being moved by the Holy Ghost, but they were being moved by the devil, and they were being moved by their belly. And so Paul, uh, Peter said, we shouldn't be surprised that where there are good, there will also be bad. We shouldn't be surprised that sometimes God permits high-level contaminants in his church. God allows sometimes a high level contaminant. Maybe a former leader, topmost leader, highly respected, a key person, a major pillar in the church. God sometimes allows that person, maybe as backsliding, and God still allows that person sometimes to come in into the church. A high level contaminant. God will prevent me but God will allow him. Why does he do that? He does that sometimes for a reason. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 19. For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Oh, he says, there must be heresies. How do we know those who are sincere, those who are right, those who are doing well, those who are strong, those who are standing still by truth, if there is no test to prove, to test, to find out whether we are all standing, if God does not allow a contaminant to come, how shall we know how many of us are still holding on the truth? 
the God does not permit a false prophet to teach his false prophecy and teach his false doctrine in our means. How shall we know those of us who are still standing? God allows this sometimes that the false prophet comes, the false teacher comes, not because God wants us to follow him, but God wants to find out whether we are still standing. Jeremiah chapter 35, long passage, I will not read it. You remember the sons of Rekha, but it's one to see. God allowed, God gave instruction to Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, stand up. Go to those people. Get pot full of wine. Get them into the temple. Don't give them the wine in your hotel. Don't give them the wine in the idol house. Take them to the house of God and tell them, this is the house of God. Me, I am man of God. A world, a nationally acclaimed prophet. And now I'm telling you, drink wine. And those sons of breaker, they said, yes, this is house of God. Yes, we respect you, Jeremiah. We will honor you. We know you are a man of God. But, sir, we have an instruction from our father that others may, we cannot. Why? They are Nazarite unto God. The Nazarite cannot take wine. Others may take it, but for us, it's taboo. No, you must take it. Am I not the prophet? He provided them cups. He provided them seeds to teach them. Everything they needed to break that law, he gave it to them. They didn't need to look for anything. Yet, those sons of Africa refused, and God was happy with them. Then, go and tell the house of Israel. The word that Rekha, he told his son, many years ago, even though he's dead now, the, that word abides. How come that you Israelites, you are not keeping my word? And because of that, Jonadab, the son of Rekha, shall not lack a man to stand before me all the days of my life, of his life, and his children's children. Because of that obedience, God allowed that test to test, to find out those who are sincere, those who are genuine. We are told that those who build big uh, edifices, strong houses, when they finish the decking, they will take that decking, take something, a very, very powerful machine, and begin to knock that decking. Begin to knock that decking. They want to test the strength, the resistance of that decking. Those who make motor cars, we are told that when they are finished, uh, to prove the strength of their cars, these very strong vehicles, messages, and all that, when they are finished making that car, they will they have a way of being remote, they can remote control that car. They set that car against a particular wall and they press the button and the vehicle moves at a particular speed, uh, maybe sometimes 60 kilometers per hour, 80 kilometers per hour. They allow the vehicle to travel some distance and they crash that vehicle against the uh, wall to see. Then they set that what is the extent of force. If the thing has crossed too much, they go back to the drawing board to strengthen the metal, the body, and the chassis, and the engine, and everything. So that if this person, if this vehicle is eventually manufactured, and it gets to the street, and people are driving it, they can tell you that if you have accident, uh, up to this extent, you are still safe, you are still secure. They do all that to test, not because they want to destroy the vehicle, but to test the strength of that vehicle. The Almighty God does the same thing. He tells us that there were false prophets among the people, even though there were good people, there were holy people, there were righteous people, but there were also unclean people. My brothers and sisters, we must be careful to remain so scripture, no matter who deviates, until the end, shall come both the good and the bad, both the godly and the ungodly, both the weak and the fair, both the good and the sheep, both the holy and the profane, it shall continue together in Christ's kingdom. And we must never forget that, that that will continue until the end of time. In Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1, but there are false prophets also among the people. Then he said, although there are the false prophets among the people, but 
be thrown with surprise, even as there shall be false teachers among you who previously shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought death and bring upon themselves sweet destruction. Here is warning from a faithful shepherd. And those are the points that we're going to concentrate on today. I told you I will not go through it back one by one because that will take time. I want to pick the important things that are relevant to us in this present circumstance as a church that has loved one another, that have continued together for all this time. And so we look at point number one, the consistent warning of faithful shepherds. The consistent warning of faithful shepherds. Point number two, the characteristic waywardness. The characteristic waywardness of faithful women. The characteristic waywardness of faith soul winners. Number three, the certainty of divine wrath on false shepherds and sheep. The certainty of divine wrath on false shepherds and sheep. Now we go to Second Peter chapter two verse one on the consistent warning of faithful shepherds. For there are false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who freely shall bring in damnable heresy, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many, many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And true for virtuousness, shall they with painted words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. The Apostle Peter, in giving a final warning to his brethren, don't forget he was the aged apostle. He had been an apostle before Christ died. And after Christ died, he continued as an apostle. We're told that the ministry of Simon Peter, after the death of Christ from the day of Pentecost, it, it went all through the time of the conversion of Apostle Paul. That will be a few years after the death and resurrection of Christ. Actually, we are told about 10 years. And then, not only that, there were other uh, times that Paul and Peter ministered together at the same time. And your contemporary second time. Don't forget, Paul said he even went to Jerusalem to go and compare notes with Peter and James and others. And then eventually put everything together. The ministry of Peter after the death of Christ, maybe about 30 years or more. Now, this man, after all those years of ministry, he now comes and he says, I want to tell you, believers, I'm going away. I will not be with you forever. And I need to let you know that. From Tiny Memorial, wherever there is original, there will be counterfeit. It happened before, and it says, there shall be false teachers among you. Peter was a faithful shepherd. And we who are leaders and ministers, we should be faithful shepherds in warning our people from time to time. Don't feel intimidated and feel that they will talk against me, that I'm preaching against people. There is no way you can warn against counterfeit without uh, mentioning that counterfeit. There is no way you can warn those who are original to be aware of counterfeit without mentioning counterfeit. That is why sometimes when we are there, we are preaching. We mention some churches and some groups that are polluting the word of God because you are leaders and we must give you warning in clear terms. Now, but Peter was not the only one that did this. As a matter of fact, you will see that this was the consistent pattern of all faithful shepherds. And if you are a faithful shepherd, you will not be different from that. In Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, beware of false prophets 
which come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. One thing you will discover in all these uh, warnings is that the consistent pattern was that you will be told to be careful of those false shepherds, and they always come in soft skinny. They don't come in openly. They don't come in clearly. They come in in a subtle, hidden manner. And so Jesus gave the warning at the beginning of his ministry. But he didn't stop there. In Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And in verse uh, 11. And many false prophets shall rise and they shall deceive many. You see the warning of Christ. He told the people, he said, look here. There are many false, false, false prophets that will arise. They will come up and they will deceive many not a few exactly what peter also said that many shall follow their pernicious ways in Acts chapter 20 verse 28 take ye therefore unto yourself and to all the bread the flock over the way the holy ghost has made you over here to be the church of god which has purchased with his own blood for i know thee that after my departing shall bridge your wolves enter in among you not tearing the floor oh this paul says <laughs> when i'm there no no will can they will be clear no can and because they know that there is a militant pastor militant apostle militant preacher militant teacher named paul apostle he's there they cannot come in if they try with eagle eye with serious vigilance they knew that Paul would not be there he gave them not a face of objection no not one hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you they knew that Paul will not take nonsense any slight deviation by an inch he will talk they will cry they will not say okay it doesn't matter the slight deviation he will not take nonsense but Paul said you know fasting is the part of our normal experience in life. We can never continue together forever and ever if something does not separate us, if transfer does not separate us, if uh, any other thing, death at least can separate us. And Paul said, in my own case, I'm going away from you, but I know something will happen. After I go, I will just give you not change to me, but you as a pastor to know. And Paul knew, he said, even though I'm here now, I know when I leave, something's going to happen. And he told them ahead. And that thing happened. If you read the history of those churches in, in Asia Minor, Ephesus, where Paul ministered, and all those other places, that thing happened. If the Kodesans came, the false doctrine, the doctrine of Balaam came, all those things came in. But Paul warned them. He said, grievous works will come, and they will not fear the floor. But that he said, those grievous works, it should have been painful enough if they were coming from outside. He said, they will not only come in from outside, even from within you also. But that is, also of your own self shall men arise. I wish he had given them chance to say, Rabbi, is this I? Is this I? He didn't give them chance. But he told them, he looked at their faces. He said, among you, some people are going to rise up. When I leave, and they are going to be speaking some perfect things, turning all that I have told you before, and turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, and corrupting the word of God. What is their goal? They want to draw disciples after them. What they could never do if Paul was there. What they would never try if Paul was there. One fall is away. Ah, they say, that man has gone. Now, we are going to have our own disciples now. And Paul wants the faithful shepherd. Let's be faithful. Let's be faithful. And I'm warning you faithfully. I'm following the footsteps of those who have gone before. That we should be on the lookout. Be on the watch out for the wolf coming from outside. And maybe we'll from inside. But I pray it will not happen. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And in verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, 
for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. He said, look there. He said, <laughs> don't be surprised. The enemy, the devil, will come. False apostle, deceitful worker. You know what that means? False apostles, they have false ministry gifts. Deceitful workers, they are ordinary workers. When we are talking about who, you think it is only those who have pulled it alone that can come in? You think it is only people who can uh, preach on Sunday or Tuesday or Friday alone that can be deceitful, that can be used by the devil? Oh no, deceitful workers. A lady came to my house. A sister actually. About uh, last week, she I met her somewhere and I said, You left church. Where did you go? I said, I know you don't have a problem with the church. I because I knew some stories about her. I know I said I know it's because you know this area of your life, this area of your life. I said, but you know we still love you. Don't forget all that we have told you, all that we have taught you. I said, my house is still open. Uh, and then uh, you can come. And then she came, and after she spoke, she said, she nailed down. She spoke a lot of things, she said, I know what God has done in my life, I know this. said, but you know, Pastor, if I didn't leave the church at the time I left, I would go to hell. Because the closest, uh, one of the people that I saw as leader, people that I saw as people that I should look up to, she said, if you know what that people, that person did, that for a long time now, she said, I will be afraid when I come to church, I will be so afraid because... I, I was afraid. Suppose this thing is known. He said, This individual will take me. I said, Is this how you are going to sit down waiting? You will not go out and help yourself. And so this individual will take her. They will go to this uh, prayer mountain. They leave that one. They go to another uh, place. And they leave that one. They go to another place. That, that's how they have been going all about. And he said, The work of it all. That this woman, this uh, lady, this other person, who is also a worker, was a worker, took her to a place. And when they go, to, and each time this person will tell her, look here, if you tell any, if you spoil me in Deepa Lounge, you spoil my name, you spoil my reputation in Deepa I will deal with you. And so they took her, they took her to this other place. And when they go there, that uh, prophetess of uh, the uh, agent of the devil said, go and buy seven D, uh, buy this uh, pond, and buy this other uh, green bucket, and buy this other thing, and bring a uh, so, so, so time. And then the sister said, he told that uh, individual that uh, this one has not be you know, I cannot do this one. Uh, and then they said, you have to do it. Already we have told you the secret, you must do it. He said, no, I cannot do it. Ah, you will not do what? You will do this one, no. If I don't have money, I will give you money. I don't have the material. I don't worry. I will buy it for you. And then, on the day they were to go to that place, this, uh, this agent of the devil came to this uh, person who was almost gone also, but I'm not totally gone, and said, let's go now. Were brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, they speak evil of the things that they understand not, and they shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and they shall receive the re reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, spot they are and blemishes, spotting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and hearts they have, exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which are forsaken the right way, and they are gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Bozo, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophets. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are leal through the loss of the flesh, through much wantonness, and those that were clean escape from them do live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves, they are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. We we'll stop there for, for the meantime. Here we are told the characteristics of these fake soul winners. Why do we call them fake soul winners? The reason is because they are winning people from Christ who have been with Christ. The genuine soul winners 
and winning people who are away from Christ and they are bringing them to Christ. But these fake soul winners, they win people who are already with Christ away from Christ. Some of them, they are ex-deeper lifers. They are preached, led, ministered, eaten in deeper life retreats and programs. But they are looking for discontented deeper life people. They are looking for dissatisfied deeper life people. They are looking for disciplined, maybe a deeper life member that has been disciplined. And those are the people they are doing evangelism to. They, they are always on the lookout. Whenever they see, maybe there is a member of deeper life, ah, they see that he didn't go to Tuesday Bible study. They watch. Uh -uh, this person they didn't go to Bible study. The following Tuesday, they pass in front of uh, his shop or a shop, or they pass in front of his house. Uh -uh, Tuesday Bible study is still not in church. Uh -uh, they, 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 go, they go to him. He say, my friend, he say, you know, uh, I, 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 I love you. And there are some things I want to tell you, uh, because I know you may not know, but I think I'd like you to, like you to know. You know that I was in deeper life before. Now, d d you didn't ask me why I left. The reason I left is because if you know things in this our deeper life, you will know that there is no church that is holy anywhere. They will then begin to... Because since you didn't go to Bible study, you must have Bible study somehow. <laughs> so, they get you. And they begin to tell you things. I will soon tell you the things they talk about that are not true. And then, maybe somebody did something deeper life, and the pastor or the leader says, go and sit down. They go to that person. They say, that's what I've been telling you people. You don't know this. What, it, it, the way they have done that, does it show love? Where is the love in what they have done now? See the way they even ask you to go and see that. They don't even love you. That's what I'm saying. Only doctrine they have in their church. They don't have love. That, see now, this thing you have done, is not worthy of discipline. But why do you need to be disciplined for in that one? There's nothing wrong in what you have done. I'm not saying that uh, one should be doing bad, but I'm only telling you that, actually, what, you have, what they have done, they are, they, they are too hard. They are just following zombie. They only know if you do wrong, straight line, follow that straight line. If you meet that straight line, they just put you aside. If one continues in that kind of a church, that you are not sure, you are not secure, you don't know when they can discipline you, one, will not, one may not even get to heaven. That, you know, in where, that was the way I was too. I also thought that deeper life was the only church, until recently. That I found that there are places where they will still discipline you, but uh, their own discipline does not belittle you. Their own discipline does not cut you down. Their own discipline does not break your back. Their own discipline does not make you sorry for your sin. And uh, they will, then they will say things. And then they will gradually, and the more you hear of that, the more you hear of that, and they, like Absalom, they steal you away. Brothers and sisters, these people, they are looking for trophies that they are going to lay down at the foot of their pastor in their new found assembly. And they will say, I have brought one of them. Those deeper life people, we will get as many as we can get. And if we have to tell lies, if we have to say things that are not true against their general superintendents, if we have to say anything that is not true against their leaders, that church, we will show them that they don't know how to do evangelism. Brothers and sisters, when you see people like that, those are fake soul winners. Those are not sent by God. They are sent by the devil. Now, how do you know them when they come? They are characteristics. Number one, in verse 10, they walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. They come to you and they don't preach messages that will make you to uh, deny the flesh. They don't say things that will make you to really walk in the spirit. They don't say things that will make you feel... Somebody told me that the reason I don't like to come to your church is that I don't like to feel guilty. And if I go to that our church, that your church, they make one feel too guilty because... And I don't want anything that will make me feel guilty. I don't want anything that will trouble my mind. I want to have peace. Peace? They don't like you to preach things that will crucify the flesh. That will tell them that flesh is an enemy. And the flesh must not be pampered. 
The flesh must not be uh, uh, must not be patted on the back. The flesh must be crucified. They want you to say things that will please the flesh, but the Bible says they walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. If anybody tells you that there is no need to for self denial again. Anybody tells you that he uh, will tell people not to wear this kind of dress, that there are too many do's and don'ts, what do they mean? Leave anybody to wear what they like. Leave the sisters to wear dresses that leave their chest. Leave the sisters to wear dresses that are so tight on their bodies and that expose the contours of their body. Leave the sisters to wear things that expose their lap. Leave the, don't wear all of the Spirit of God. Why should we put people under bondage? Now, once they are talking like that, you know that these are deviants. They have deviated from the truth. He may be a preacher in deeper life before. He might have preached in deeper life congress before. That's the highest meter of deeper life, at least for as at now. He might have preached in that before. He might have preached in any meeting before. Huh. They walk after the flesh. Somebody preached many, many times before. And then began to pick the girls in the church one by one until he had finished with 13 women in his church and messed up, messed up, messed up, messed up, you know, all of those people still keep on preaching. And so you find that uh, when they are walking out of the flesh, somebody goes for counseling as the woman is going to grab the woman from the back and they go, Pastor, why are you doing this now? Sorry about it, sorry about it. They that walk after the flesh and in the loss of uncleanness. When you see that happening, you know this one is no longer of God. Number two, they despise government. That is, they refuse all forms of control and restraints. When you find someone that is always critical of leadership, he criticizes this leader and that leader and that other leader. He criticizes the zona leader, the coordinator, the group coordinator, the overall pastor, the GS, this everybody. He doesn't even know anybody you cannot talk against. He despises government. He doesn't like to be controlled. He doesn't like to be restrained. He just wants to he despise. To despise means he treats the leadership with carelessness. He does he say, I don't fear anybody. I only fear Almighty God. If somebody talks like that, I don't fear anybody. I only fear God. Don't mind him. Don't mind her. He doesn't fear anybody. He doesn't fear God. Have you read your Bible? Love the brotherhood. Uh, honor the king. Or something like that. Fear God. It's the same thing together. If you fear God, you honor and you fear the king. And you find that he, do, he despises government. I want to tell you. I don't know whoever is coming. He may not have much. He may not be anything. But if he is sent by God, sent by the leader, that's the man. And if anybody despises him, or despises her, or despises government, already that individual is going astray. They despise government. Then, number three, presumptuous. He says, they are presumptuous. Presumptuous are they. That means, they are bold. Daring, headstrong, fearless, in a negative sense now, self willed, self sufficient, following their own opinions, which no authority can induce them to relinquish. They follow their own opinion, no man on earth can change their mind, not even their leader. Such people. They despise government. Presumptuous are they. Then it says, self-willed. Those are the marks of fake people. Self-willed. Presumptuous. Then it says, number three, no, sorry, number four, they are not afraid to speak of dignities. Then it says in verse 11, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, they bring not really an accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute breeds, made to be taken and destroyed, they speak evil of the things that they understand not. Brothers and sisters, before I explain verse 11 to you, let me talk about verse 12. It is not everything in deeper life you understand. 
I hope all of you know the location pastors, local government pastors. It's not everything in deeper life, you understand. Group coordinators, it's not everything in deeper life, you understand. Myself, it's not everything I understand. Maybe I know more than most of us, but I don't know everything. And if you don't know, understand something, keep your mouth shut. Don't talk about it. The Bible says, these people speak evil of the things that they understand not. How many people have spoken many, many things? Later they realize their foolishness. But restitution becomes difficult. If you don't understand something, keep your mouth shut. Say, I don't understand it. How, what do you think about this matter? I don't think anything because I don't understand it. I told you when we came back from Congress, I said many things are going to be happening. After that Congress, I said things are going to be happening. I said we have not had the last. I told you here in this pulpit. And uh, those things are happening and here and there and all over the place. I told you before. I remember. And I told you at that time, keep your mouth shut. Many things are going to be happening. You will hear about this. You, especially those of you who probably you travel up and down or you have access to other people. You go about, you hear things. Yeah. Don't go about listening for things. Satan will preach to you. You will hear things. And if you speak about what you don't understand, you join the group of these people. The Bible is called talking against. Then in verse 11, to understand verse 11, you have to follow me to Jude. Jude, in verse 8. Likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities yet michael the archangel when contending with the devil he disputed about the body of moses he does not bring against him a railing accusation but he said the lord rebuke thee but these speak evil of those things which they know not but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves parallel passage to Say Second Peter. What he's telling us was that when Moses died, now Old Testament does not tell us this. This is revelation. This is inspiration. These people were not there, but the Holy Ghost told them what happened. That when Moses died, God buried him. But before the thing was done, the Israelites were down there, and Moses was up there. And when he died, his body was on the ground like this. Before the angel would come and take him to heaven, the devil had got there before the angel, and the devil said. This one belongs to me. And as the angel wanted to tell, he said, stop there. And although we are not there, we can almost imagine he would have been saying, this one belongs to me. He's a murderer. He killed a man. Have you forgotten? And the Michael, the archangel, the greatest angel in heaven, and then the former greatest angel in heaven, Lucifer, and the now greatest angel in heaven, Mike Angel, uh, uh, Michael, they met. It was an encounter. And even though Lucifer was falling, Lucifer had left, he had been, he had been cast out of heaven. Yes, Michael recognized that this was my leader. This was my over me before. And he could not even bring a railing accusation against him. He had to say, I come to you, not in my own name, but the Lord has sent me, rebuke you. If Michael can say that to a, fall, to a fallen fellow, how dare you speak evil of a minister, of a leader that is still standing? That's what the Bible is saying. And if that is the truth, what then do you think about people who talk anyhow? Their mouth runs loose. And they say, although I know I'm in deeper life, but this is our choice. Mm, this is our choice. Oh, I know I'm, I'm in deeper life. Oh, those of you are outside, well, you are outside, but I'm inside, but actually. And they talk. And you find they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And uh, when you speak evil of dignity, anybody that is above you, that's the dignity. If you're a house leader, your zone leader, your women rep is the dignity over you. And if you are at that level, your coordinator is a dignity over you. 
And if you're a coordinator, the group coordinator is a dignity over you. And if you're a group coordinator, location pastor, local government pastor, the overseer, whoever it may be, is a dignity over you. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Now, we are now told characteristics of the people that are false and fake people. We are told that they speak evil of dignities. Then, number five, we are told in verse 13, this they shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. They are pleasure seekers who deny the reality of the cross of Christ. Pleasure. Anybody that comes to you and tells you that the gospel he brings is the gospel that has no cross. Is the gospel that has no demand from you. Is the gospel that has, that will not cost you anything. Is the gospel that will not pay you in any way. Is the gospel of convenience. The gospel of of uh, easiness. Don't accept that gospel. Somebody tells you he wants you to serve God, but you know nowadays the service we want to give to God is the one that will be convenient for our flesh. Brother, move from this district. Go and be helping in that other district. Pastor, don't you know that place is far from my house? Pastor, don't you understand? That place is far from my place of work. Pastor, don't you understand? My brother, don't you understand that Calvary is far from heaven? Don't you understand that the nail on the hand is far from the crown that he has in heaven in the throne? The worship of angels? How far is the worship of angels to the spitting of men? What is the distance? Go from here, go and be helping in the district there. You say, Pastor, don't you understand that place is far? Go to village there. You say, Pastor, the trekking. Is it about the Almighty God. Coming in human form. Trekking without any vehicle. Think about that. And uh, you see, the Bible tells us, these people, they have pleasure. They are looking for pleasure. Not pain at all. And then we are told, number six, they are impure, immoral, and corrupting. Verse 14 tells us, these people, before we go to verse 14, it says, spots they are, they are blemishes. These are people that defile you. you. Before you meet them, your heart is pure. When they leave you, your heart is polluted. If you have such people for friends, cut away from them. They always have a story to tell. By the time they finish their story, you are pure before they came. By the time they come, you are unclean. Your mind has become disturbed. And I've known people like that. And what I did was to stop going to them. See the people that I go to, I have position, I have office or anything. But whenever you leave there, the things they say, the things they say, the things they say, by the time you leave this person, your mind is, uh, you know, disturbed and all that. The secret, the antidote is not to say, I will cover my heart with the blood of Jesus before I go to him. The secret is not to go at all. And so, it says, spot there and blemishes. Spotting themselves with their own deceiving while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls and had they have exercised the covetous practices cost children. I had somebody speak again this church recently. He was he's a preacher, he was in deeper life before, and he was speaking. He says he has a large church now, and he says, uh, you know, uh, they, they were doing a minister's conference, so I just went to see what they were doing. They said, You people never come, you never come. So I, they invited me, so I went there, the chapel there. And this fellow that was in deeper life before was talking, and he said, You know, in those days, the way we sold our trouser, shapeless trouser, we just give it to Taylor, and Taylor doesn't measure us. And then when we wear it, then we do like this, and we are walking quietly, and we bow down our head. They are making jests of holiness. That you know, why should you bow your head? You walk any, look at anything. Why should you do? Your eyes are yours, and if you look at with your eyes and you commit sin, it means that something is wrong with you. They are deceiving themselves. They are not clean. They are not pure. And when you see people like that that are encouraging you that anything you want to watch, watch. You want to watch dirty picture, watch it. You want to watch dirty magazine, watch it. You want to look at anything, look at anything you like, and look at a sister in the eye and say, sister. Deep in the eye, look and say, sister, I really love you. That's what they say in their fellowship. They say, look at your fellow brother in the eye. Look at your fellow sister in the eye. And they say, say it with all your heart. I love you. <laughs> That's what they say. And in so doing, they are promoting lust, immorality, no wonder they are not clean. Having eyes full of immorality, full of adultery, that cannot cease from sin. If you are looking at somebody and you see that your heart is disturbed, look away. That's holiness. 
the one you say I don't have to look away, it doesn't show holiness. I, I can never lose. Who are you? You will lose. He said, me? I can never be tempted to be to lost. You are deceiving yourself. You are wasting your time. The devil catches people like that very easily. That is why the Bible tells us their holiness principle. Your bodily members must be under your control. Then, in number seven, he says they are covetous and they are greedy. He says in verse 14, they are, are exercised with covetous practices. Cursed children. They are forsaking the right way. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, uh, the son of Bosa, who loved the ways of unrighteousness. And uh, he was rebuked for his iniquity. There's covetousness and greediness in those assemblies. Brothers and sisters, check up all those who have left this church. I say this with all sense of responsibility. Maybe they didn't want to leave. I don't know. Maybe it was the devil. Because the devil doesn't like anybody to get to heaven. I don't have a problem with their living. But I have a problem that soon after they have left, not up to one month after they leave, not one to two months after they leave, not up to three months after they leave, all the things they believed before, they held before, they don't even drop it one by one, they drop it wholesale. And they ask them, ah, how about this thing that you had? I was told about one of them, they had seen they said, this thing you are preaching now, that you are talking now. If pastor, when pastor was there, sitting down, and you are talking, you didn't say this. He said, yes, at that time, I spoke because pastor was there. That's what he wanted to hear. That's what I told there. Now I'm no longer there. I can say what I like. Are you preaching because of what pastor wants to hear or because you are convinced in the word of God? Is it because, ah, if I say anything wrong now, they will stand up and correct it immediately. Therefore, let me see what they like to hear. If I have opportunity to go out, I say another thing. The heart of man is deep, desperately wicked. So, as we look at all these characteristics, bring, bring your life in line and see where do you stand and how is your life. They are covetous and greedy. Then, verse 17 tells us, they are often a disappointment. It says, wells without water, clouds with a tempest, uh, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Wells without water. You know, in those days, uh, this is talking about people who look like a well that should furnish people the water of life for those who are thirsty for salvation. But when those people get there to that well, you cannot get. In the desert in those days, there was the greatest peak sight you could see is to see well ahead of you in the desert. And if we're even told that the task gets so much that sometimes some of these people, they will be seeing illusions. Something in front will look like water before they, they will run there. And there are times they get to a place that is actually a well. They say, thank God, I've got to water now. They lower their pocket, the well has dried up. This is talking about people that promise much, but they do little. They speak, ah, they say, others can deny you, I will never deny you. Oh, it's a lie. They say, I believe these things that we are talking about, but actually in their heart. They don't believe. They are wells without water. They are clouds without rain. And they are tempests that is carried about. And they are disappointment. Then, number nine, they seduce the unwary, the, uncare, the careless, and they bring them back into bondage. Those who have been made free from sin and error. Those who had escaped sin and error before, they bring them back into bondage. They bring them back into bondage. That's verse 18. Then number 10, which is the last one. They are backsliders who are looking for ample company on their pilgrimage to hell. And looking for company, verses 19 to 22. They will be promising people liberty, but they themselves, they are servants of corruption. And they themselves, they are under the bondage of the devil. And they were believers before, but they have gone away. My brothers and sisters, as we come to the church... Stand by the grace of God. In case anybody stands up here later and says that holiness is not so, and says that the word of God is not so, don't believe them. Don't follow them. If anybody rises up here and says, by the virtue of your position I've attained as this or that, and he begins to tear down the truth of the word of God. I remember the way the G.I. said this some time ago. He said, if he dies and he goes home, and somebody cuts there and he begins to, you know, say some things and uh, tear down the word of God. He said, some of you sisters over there, I hope you will get up where you are and you come to the front of the altar here and begin to pray against that individual. 
that God will judge you once he's there. And he said, you ushers, you will get up where you are. Come and withdraw pulpit. You electronics people, remove your microphone from him. So that he, can know, he will not send people to hell. May the Lord help us. I believe God will keep you. I believe God will keep us. Yes, people may fall. They may deviate. But grace is available to keep us. I go to the last point before we pray. Certainty of divine wrath on false shepherds and sheep. False sheep. There is the judgment of God upon false shepherds and false sheep. I go to Second Peter chapter 3, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and he spared not the old world, but he saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, he condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after shall live godly. And he delivered just Lord, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in sin and hearing, he vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth then, knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. The Lord is telling us here that the judgment of all false professors, preachers, is sure. You may hear of some big, big names that have been old, old time people in this church. We respected them. We honored them. While they continued in the truth. When they deviate from the truth of the word of God, we don't give them any single respect in their falsehood. We don't abuse them or we don't listen to them. We don't honor them. In whose eyes a vile person is content. But honor it there. That do what? I fear the Lord. Only those who fear the Lord with people we should honor. Don't honor anybody who doesn't fear God. Here we are told about the judgment of false professors. Verse 12. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed. That's their judgment. That they shall uh, they speak evil of the things that they understand not, and they shall utterly perish in their own corruption. That's their judgment. Verse 17. The latter part of verse 17. To whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. That's their judgment. Verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. That's their judgment. And in verse uh, 3, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. What that means is that that damnation is coming. Surely, if God speared not the angels, he will not spear all the apostates. If God speared not men in the days of Noah, he will not spear all those who deviate and they don't repent. If God did not spear people in the days of Sodom, remember, Sodom had no Bible. And if God speared not people who had no Bible, do you think he will spear those who have Bible and they turn it upside down? He will not. He will not clear the guilty today if they refuse to repent. In all the cases I have cited to you, Noah, Sodom, and the angels that fell, the judgment of God was, number one, impartial. Number two, unsparing. Number three, fierce. Number four, total. But thank God. Number five, designing. The judgment of God that came upon the angels as sin was impartial. Even Lucifer was judged. I'm sure Satan would have been surprised. So God can discipline me also. Because he was so high. <laughs> he thought that he was too high for God to bring down. Impartial, unsparing, fierce, total. The judgment that came upon Noah's people in the days of Noah was impartial, unsparing, fierce, and total. The judgment that came upon Sodom and Gomorrah was impartial, unsparing, fierce, and total. But finally, in all those cases too, the judgment was 
discerning. You know what that means? No, I escaped because he didn't deserve judgment. Lord escaped because he didn't deserve judgment. The judgment of God can be hot, but it is designing. God does not punish the righteous with the wicked. And my brothers and sisters, all those who are righteous people, although they dwell in the midst of cross corruption, evil, if they remain in their righteousness, they will surely receive God's commendation in the midst of others receiving strong condemnation. I round off with that joyful truth to tell you that when God is bringing fierce judgment upon those who are sinful, God's judgment is discerning. He always separates those who are godly. The righteous will never suffer with the wicked. And if in all this assembly only one person remains righteous, God will deal with the others clean and clear. He will leave that person. He will not punish him. In Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, and in verse 24. After bringing judgment upon Thyatira and all the people there and Jezebel and everybody, verse 24, the revelations too. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as he speak, I will put upon you none other body. You see that? God said, all the people there are terrible, they are wolves. But there are a few of you there, I know you. My brothers and sisters, others may fall, people may fall, 10,000 on your left, 1,000 on your right. If you stand true, God will spot you out of that millions of people. If you remain faithful in this our church, to the word of God, God will spot you out. You may not be anybody, you may not be known, they may not give you title or position in your corner, anywhere you are, God will spot you out. Revelation chapter 3 verse 4. After bringing a correction to Sadis and telling them that they are falling and they needed to repent and all that, verse 4, thou hast a few names, even in Sadis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. I just made up my mind that God be my helper. I'll be one of those people. Remain faithful. Walking in wise. Remaining undefiled. Remaining worthy in the sight of God. And if you are only one person in the whole of deeper life in the region, or Shun State, or Nigeria, God will spot you out. He will not judge you with the wicked. There is judgment coming on false people, but there is commendation coming for true people. Will you remain true, brothers, sisters? Remain true no matter what. Stand true no matter what. Stand as the Bible stands no matter what. Anybody may deviate. Anybody may go anywhere. Don't follow them. Well, I know you pray, but in case this person talking deviates, don't follow him. But I know I will not deviate. But God will give grace. And as I pray day by day, keep me, Lord, keep me true, Lord, keep me true. God loves those who are trembling in His presence. He loves those who daily go before Him and say, God, I don't have wisdom. I don't have intelligence. I'm a small child. I don't know too much. I don't know as much as those people. I'm not exposed. But God, you can keep me. God loves those people. He keeps them. That's why I know He's going to keep me. And if you have a heart like my own, no matter what may happen, you will stand. God will keep you standing. The journey is still far. We don't know how far it is. We don't know when Jesus will come. We don't know when the trumpet will sound. We don't know when you will die. We don't know when I will die. We don't know when we will see again. But one thing is sure, if you stand true, we'll see in the kingdom of God. Let's rest upon prayer.